going from a standard set of headers to a set of 180 degree headers could make your American V8 go from sounding like this to this. Alright guys, today we're going to talk all about 180 degree headers. As you can see, I just finished making a set for my 1963 Studebaker Lark, and a lot of you are probably going to be saying, well hang on a second, I thought you were going to put a turbo onto that. Well, plans have changed, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. So to start off, I want to take you through why I wanted to do a set of 180 degree headers on this car. And for that, we're going to go to the whiteboard. So let's start off with why you would even do a set of 180 degree headers. The pros to a 180 degree header setup is the sound, the improved exhaust scavenging, street cred, and it looks cool. The cons to doing a set of 180 degree headers is they are harder to package, they are harder and more expensive to manufacture, they usually will weigh more just because you need more tubing, they are harder to work around, and it is harder to get a uh, shorter primary on the engine for those high revving engines. To me, the sound alone is enough for me to want to do a set of 180 headers, so um, that's why I chose to go this direction. Now, a header consists of these primary tubes and a collector. And basically, you uh, route the exhaust from each cylinder into the collector, and this is where the majority of the noise from the engine is produced. Now, if we look at a standard header for a V8, it is easiest to collect all of the even cylinders, two, four, six, and eight, into one side, and all of the odd cylinders, one, three, five, and seven, into the other collector. The problem with this is we get into issues where the pulses going into the collector are not timed evenly. And for that, let's look at the whiteboard to give a better demonstration. So the firing order of a LS or LT motor, in our case we're running an LT motor, is 18726543. And if we go through that crankshaft rotation and sort of uh, plot the uh, pulses going into the collectors on a left to right basis, what you will see is that we get a pulse going into the left collector, then the right, then the left, then the right, then the right again, then the left, then the right, then the left, then the left again. What this does is it produces an uneven pulse going into your collector on both sides of the engine. So if you look at this drawing here, what you will see is this basically represents the four tubes going into the actual collector, like what you see here. And if we go through the firing order, going from one to seven, there will be a 180 degree split. From seven to five, we get a 270 degree split. 5 to 3, we get a 180 degree split again, and then from 3 to 1, we get a 90 degree split. On the right side, going from 8 to 2, we get 180, 2 to 6, 90, 6 to 4, 180, and from 4 to 8, 270. What that produces is from this collector here, we get a much higher frequency from this 90 degree split, and a much lower frequency from this 270 degree split, and then we get our regular 180 degree split frequency. And these frequencies will sort of lay over top of each other and sort of make a uh, chord or a uh, harmonic, and it sort of jumbles the sound of the exhaust up and makes it sound like the V8 that we're all accustomed to. 
So basically what happens when you go to a set of 180 degree headers is you basically go to uh, what would be more similar to like a flat plane crank and we are going to route the exhaust from six over to the other collector, five over to the other collector, four over to the opposite collector, and three over to the opposite collector. So over here, I have a new diagram drawn for that uh, revised uh, bank placement of the tubes. And what you will see is we have a pulse on the left, pulse on the right, 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 and so on. And going to our new diagram for our collector, we have a 180 degree split, 180 degree split, 180 degree split, 180 degree split. And now you know why they call it 180 degree headers. So this will happen on both sides of the engine. Now what this does for you is it improves exhaust scavenging. Basically the exhaust going into your collector is going to do so in a much more predictable fashion. And because of that, we can use the primary tubes to basically help the exhaust to create velocity and sort of siphon the exhaust from the next exhaust pulse out of the engine and this will improve the airflow through the engine. So what does this look like in practice? So in practice, it looks a lot like this. As you can see, I have a nice setup here that I just got done making for my Studebaker. And what you can see on the bottom is the two middle cylinders from either side are being routed to the opposite side of the engine. Then you'll see these big swooping loops up here on top. And basically what we're doing here is we're trying to get primary length that will match the primary length of the tubes that are going underneath the engine. Now, as I mentioned earlier with a set of 180 degree headers, it is a little bit harder to get a shorter primary length just because you have to run the primary tubes from the one side of the engine all the way to the other side of the engine. Because of this, the primary length that I was forced into with this particular package was right around 36 inches, which is going to produce a uh, peak scavenging right around 5,000 RPMs with the uh, particular engine that we are working with. Now, 180 degree headers are nothing new. In fact, during Le Mans back in the 60s, when Ford beat Ferrari, they actually were using 180 degree headers. Now, if you look on one of those cars, being that it is a rear engine setup, they actually could route the exhaust behind the engine and get a shorter overall primary length. Because of this, you can optimize the header for a higher frequency, or in English, a higher engine RPM, and it will want to make more horsepower. Now, 180 degree headers uh, definitely improve the noise of the engine, but without something else, they still sound like a set of uh, dueling four cylinders. And what it needs off of the back of the two collectors is a Y pipe. Now, what this Y pipe will do is it will take this nice even frequency, which is going to be identical to a four cylinder, and it will sort of take those two frequencies and lay them over top of each other and turn it into an eight cylinder. So just to give you guys proof of this, here is a engine with a set of standard headers. Now with 180 degree headers, but no Y pipe. And finally, the original engine that we played with the standard headers with 180 degree headers and a Y pipe. As 
you can see, that Y pipe sound, that's what I'm after. Getting into further what I said about um, the difficulty with packaging a set of 180 degree headers, um, let's just go over all of the modifications that I had to make to my particular chassis just to fit the 180 degree headers. As you can see, I have made pretty significant modification to the cross member. Um, as you can see, I made a totally uh, tubular, a totally tubular, yeah, totally tubular dude, um, <laughs> totally tubular cross member here and moved it uh, pretty far forward, as you can see here. And, um, you know, added a lot of bracing to sort of, um, you know, reinforce all of that. And also, I went to a different steering rack and moved that pretty far forward as well. Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make room for the four tubes that go underneath of the engine. And uh, that was definitely necessary on this particular chassis. Also, you'll see that I went to a nice motor plate here in the front, and the idea with that is to uh, get rid of the motor mounts on the side of the block and allow us to have a lot more space to run the tubes for the 180 degree headers. So this is definitely not for everybody. Um, I totally get if uh, <laughs> that's not your cup of tea, but um, I think it's going to make a pretty uh, awesome setup, so uh, I'm sure it's going to sound cool, and uh, I'm excited. Another thing that I need to go over is uh, I want to say a big thanks to our friends at Stainless Header Manufacturing Incorporated. And if you're not familiar with these folks, they are pretty much the only people that make exhaust flanges for the Vortec 4200. Because of this, I contacted them. Um, actually, we talked to them at uh, PRI last year and, uh, you know, hung out a little bit. And uh, they have hooked us up with uh, some really nice uh, collectors that you see here. These things are fully TIG welded and uh, pretty much top of the line. They have the reduced section in the center, which improves the exhaust velocity. So really happy to be working with these guys, and uh, if you guys need any header material flanges, you should definitely check them out. The last thing that I want to talk about in this video is sort of uh, the new direction for the Studebaker. For those that were just here to... Uh, uh, you know, hear my discussion on the 180 degree headers. You can tune out now if you'd like. Uh, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Let's talk about uh, the new direction for my Studebaker and sort of the um, new direction for the channel. As you guys are probably more than aware, um, we had a pretty serious incident, uh, you know, a little over a month ago. Now, I've said in the past that Turbos are awesome. We really love turbos on this YouTube channel, but they can be a double-edged sword. And what I mean by that is it is so easy to get carried away. It's so easy to say, ah, just another pound of boost. Ah, just, just one more pound of boost. Ah, let's throw five at it. Yeah, you know, it'll be all right. And then you chuck a connecting rod out the side of the block and, um, you end up in the situation that we were with the Volvo. I really don't want to do that with uh, this, my first car, a 1963 Studebaker Lark. And um, I really don't feel like putting uh, the amount of bars into the car that would make me feel comfortable doing that. Not to say we aren't going to add more bars and a better seat to this car, which I uh, fully intend to do but we're not going to go to the level um, that the Volvo was. Because of all the reasons that I just talked about, the turbo needs to go. I don't need the temptation, and because of that, I decided that it would be better to go the naturally aspirated route, and that will sort of um, keep me from going too far with this particular car. My goal is to make a stick shift 10.00 second car and I'm really excited to show you what we picked up in the next video in that department. 
So all that being said, uh, we still plan to go fast with other cars in the future, but we're just not gonna do it with this one. So why not make it sound cool and have a really cool exhaust setup when you pop the hood and have fun that way. So I hope you guys uh, sort of see where I'm coming from there. Um, I'm sure most of you will totally understand. So look forward to future content on that. Now, as you guys know, we were planning to do a side-by-side uh, -side build with this car and my dad's Studebaker. Um, that is actually in the other barn right now, and we are in the process of building that car. All right, guys. Well, we're going to give you a quick update on the uh, Studebaker project. As you know, we were planning on doing a uh, two dudes with two studs. Uh, uh, video series and we're kind of anxious to share these with you and uh, coincidentally today happens to be registration day for um, drag week so as we got working on the car we were struggling with a decision to uh, 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 make on the manual versus automatic and uh, as you know a month and a half ago I had the accident down in uh, Georgia and I'm still struggling with healing, got a little ways to go. I'm still black and blue all the way from my wrist up and over my shoulder. Uh, but uh, in light of that, we decided to go with a manual transmission. So I'm going to be working hard to uh, get myself uh, in uh, shape again to be able to do uh, manually shifting. And we plan to show up uh, in uh, South Carolina with a manual shifted gasser. Uh, productivity has been extraordinarily slow as recovery has been slow but what we have been able to do is just put the leaf springs on and put the front axle on and plan out our steering. Uh, recently picked up a uh, Vega manual box. We're going to cross steer that. We have to make the uh, drag link up yet and uh, we've got the spring mounts made and right now we were Starting to work on the cross member for the uh, transmission. Uh, we were going to go with an automatic, but uh, uh, I'm up for the challenge, and that's the uh, way we're going with the manual. So, uh, pretty excited about that because both cars are going to have manual transmissions and uh, uh, two dudes, two studs, uh, manual transmissions, uh, small block Chevys. It should be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Gen 1 versus Gen 5. <laughs> uh, hopes for the car is to be able to run this in some of the uh, local uh, nostalgia races. So obviously a small block Chevy would be a logical choice. Uh, this is nothing too fancy. Uh, the block and the crank actually, I bought those for $22 out of a, a scrapyard just east of here. And uh, uh, the heads I traded some parts for, the intake I bought at a flea market camshaft is a refugee from a uh, another flea market and uh, uh, we're hoping that this thing will push uh, this car along you know mid tens hopefully low tens or high nines at some point but uh, our first goal is to get the car running so we recently um, set the engine in it took a little bit of time to figure out exactly we, where we were going to place it as uh, we were preparing for different events, what I noticed is that a uh, number of them dictate a limit on your engine setback, but uh, Sick Week has a restriction of only an 8 inch firewall setback, so that one was actually the most restrictive, and that's what uh, ultimately uh, dictated where we placed the engine. So the new firewall, when it goes in, We'll be able to work around the engine and it calculates out to a 6.7% engine setback. This massive gaping hole was actually something that uh, uh, had been created by the previous owner when they put a, believe it or not, they cut this huge hole for a four cylinder. When we bought the um, car and on some of the previous videos, you saw us fire up the Iron Duke that was in the car with a um, Saginaw four speed. Our plans are to use this small block with the five speed and uh, we're gonna bring the fender well headers up and over. The original outriggers are gonna get removed 
and we brought the steering box through the frame and the springs as far outboard as what made sense for um, keeping the car stable. Yeah, funnily enough, this engine had a set of 180 degree headers and we're actually taking them off to put on a standard set of headers because uh, we want to go with a fender well style setup um, just because it's an old gasser and that's what you do on old gassers, right dad? <laughs> For you guys who know me from my past, uh, that you all know that I am a huge Studebaker fan, at least for the bodies, and uh, I've had a Studebaker for uh, over 40 years, and uh, one of my favorites, all-time favorites, was uh, Ted Harvitt's uh, Chicken Hawk, and unfortunately that car came to its demise in a drag strip crash a number of years ago. Uh, Ted uh, has always been very supportive of all of our uh, creations and all of our craziness that we've done with our Studebakers and I always love that uh, on his car he had this uh, roof line and glass package in the back and uh, this is factory um, Studebaker still has the original seat we'll be taking all of that stuff out to make more room for luggage and haul things but uh, it's a pretty neat car you don't see too many of these and we uh, pulled it out of a, uh, a barn in Virginia Calvin and I ran down and picked it up uh, uh, about the last year and um, we had started to work on the car and didn't make much progress on it. Obviously, uh, sick week and the Volvo build was uh, our primary focus. But uh, now that we're back from that and I'm starting to recover, I'm hoping to get a little bit of time out here, albeit slow, but uh, hopefully steady and we'll be uh, ready for uh, drag week in uh, five to six months and six months. Yep, 176 days, I think it is. 76 days, that hurts my head. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, so you're going to have to weigh in in the comments down below. Gen 1, Gen 5. Junior, Pop. Who do you think's going to pull off the win on this competition? Catch you in the next one, guys. See you at Drag Week.